So welcome. Uh, again, my name is Mary Bath with Sponsor Circle and today's session is uh, with Brad McCabe of Sponsor Circle as well as Brent Barodis who will be speaking about sponsorship in COVID times. I see that we have a majority of participants are in so I will pass it over now to Brad McCabe. Great, thanks Mary Beth, and th thank you Brent for taking part in this. Uh, this is the uh, second session today we've uh, run with Brent. It's been really good engagement. Uh, we had a, a good conversation about an hour ago, a mix of brands and properties and agencies uh, and some good good conversation. In fact, with Brent and I prepared a, a quite a number of questions we didn't actually get to because the, uh, the conversation was so uh, so engaging. Uh, so looking forward to, to everyone's insight here. Feel free to ask questions in the chat on the right hand side. Uh, very happy to have you come in and, uh, and join in if you uh, are up for asking a question or putting your video on live. Uh, what we're hoping to go through today is looking at, you know, COVID-19 has definitely had an impact uh, on, on brands, on events, with organizations, uh, and it's changing day by day. Uh, so wh what can we do to start? Uh, how can we manage through this crisis? Uh, what are we doing with our partners now? And if you're not doing it, what should you be doing with your partners? Uh, and then you know, every crisis has a beginning, a middle and the end. Uh, and a number of us have been with organizations for quite some time and, and seen different, uh, different crises on a, a smaller or a local scale. Uh, personally, I, I worked with the Ontario Science Centre when uh, SARS hit in 2003 and that just decimated the tourism industry uh, in Toronto and Southern Ontario. Uh, and there was a lot of impact in terms of, of partnerships, uh, but then also looking at the growth coming out of it, uh, how the government came back on board, how we worked with partners. Uh, similarly, in 2008, uh, the federal government really stepped up with the marquee event program. Uh, and it was, how can you prepare yourself for those kinds of activities? We, you know, we know the government at some point is going to get involved. Uh, so from a property side, what can you be doing? From a brand side, how can you be preparing? And then also how, how can you be dealing with everything that you've got on going uh, in terms of your messaging, your marketing, how that's pivoting? Uh, and then how can we work together to, to you know, create some great success and really have the engagement that all of our activities bring to the table uh, and uh, continue that on the upside of, uh, of this crisis when it comes about. Uh, Brent, do you want to introduce yourself and uh, open it up? Great, thanks very much. Thanks Brad for, and uh, Mary Beth for having me. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to share some thoughts and, and be part of this conversation. And thanks to everybody else who's, uh, who's tuned in and uh, who's participating, I, I look forward to it. As you said, my name is Brent Berrudis and I'm with the Partnership Group Sponsorship Specialists, a sponsorship consulting firm. And we've probably been re busier these last two weeks or three weeks than I expected to be uh, when we set in with uh, COVID-19 around, you know, the middle of March. And I thought, okay, great. I can get caught up on a bunch of work, probably spend some additional time with my family. And the last three weeks have been really busy for us just working with our clients, uh, helping them through this process, and looking forward to sharing some of those thoughts that, uh, and experiences with you uh, and everybody on this, on this session today. So. Great, well, happy to have you here. And I'll throw out a, a special welcome to, to Adrian from, uh, from Australia for getting up so early to join us on this conversation. So look forward to any insight you have from, uh, from the Australian perspective. Uh, and you, know, you seem to be on a, a different path uh, in terms of where COVID is going. So maybe you're coming out of it faster than us. So uh, the planning process may be different. So uh, really would appreciate that insight as we get going. Uh, but, you know, this, this crisis is, is affecting everyone. Uh, you know, people are trying to uh, you know, figure out where they sit. Uh, the financial impact has been pretty immediate uh, and the sort of preparing for the next stage financial impact uh, is definitely either freezing individuals, trying to figure out, okay, we don't want to spend anything right now or realizing that, okay, we're, you know, we're having a huge impact with our staff. We can't be 
spending money on this this element of marketing how do we pivot how do we shift what we're doing in, in that terms of engagement uh, and then from the property side just how do you how do you engage with uh, your existing partners uh, i know we've been having a lot of conversations with clients of ours and we've seen an interesting mix of uh, of activity but brent what's what's your advice then on you know where should people people be sitting with their partners and the communications with them I think there's really, um, as I said in the last session, there's there's really two two lines of communication that I believe are, are critical at this time. And one is to communicate with your partners, period. Um, if you're a brand, if you're a uh, property, it doesn't matter. You should be reaching out to your partner, talking to them, understanding what they're going through, uh, how it's affecting their business, uh, what, what they see down the line, all of those sorts of things. And understanding that what's happening with the sponsorship program is it you know uh did you just cancel an event uh were you a sponsor of an event that was just canceled uh is something been postponed is something coming up uh, is this something that's supposed to happen in october and you're still looking steady at it that's the type of information we need to communicate back and forth understanding that uh, truly understanding your partner's business because your partner's business is really different today than it was three weeks ago and it's really different probably from even last week so every day that goes past makes a different sort of scenario so we need to be in touch with with our partners but also knowing that that uh whether you're a property or a brand and you're talking to your partner that sponsorship is a part of the business but it's not the whole business that uh, you need to be understanding that the, your partner's staff and their families um, and the mental well-being of their families is, is critical. So those are elements that are more important. Uh, it could be around payroll, it could be around production, it could be around a whole bunch of other things. Sponsorship may be down on the list. Uh, uh, we're, we're not saving lives in sponsorship. So uh, I think that we need to, to understand that that's also a part of the factor and, and discuss that during that during that conversation and during that communication the other part of the communication channel is sharing that about your partner is understanding that you know they are doing something in the marketplace whether it's they are uh assimilating ppe to get to some uh hospital or whether they are uh like telus is uh, uh working closely with the telus convention center in calgary and and sitting there and converting that over into a homeless shelter for the time being so um if tell us is your partner are you sharing that information are you sharing the knowledge around that uh, recently air canada just you know hired back sixteen thousand five hundred of their employees affected this morning to be able to put them back to work and they're paying them retroactively to the middle of march if you're you know a, a festival or an event or a program that uh a facility, I don't care what it is, that, that Sarah Canada is your partner, are you sharing that knowledge and letting people know that, you know, their their CEO and their COO have both and their CFO, all three of them have, you know, taken major cutbacks. In fact, they've, they've deferred their, their salaries for the next uh, several months. And at the same time, all their management has taken a, a hit of at least 10%, uh, some of them higher in, in, uh, in their uh salaries so these are things that your partners are doing or or maybe you're doing something in the marketplace and you want to tie your partner in because it's a good project that you're doing that, that's going to get a lot of goodwill associated with it well let's see what partners you can bring along for that coattail ride uh that's the two types of communication that we're talking to our clients about to start with is that, that uh, uh number one make sure you are communicating with your partners and number two how can you shine a light uh, good light on your partners during this period in time to give them some additional exposure. And the third part, communication-wise, is really just understanding that this shift to virtual to digital is not only happening for us right now as we're, we're having this forum, but also the new world of sponsorship is going to be shifted uh, into virtual reality. It's going to be shifted into virtual uh, experiences and it's going to be shifted into uh, digital being a, a way bigger priority. So those communication channels, we have to learn better, we have to integrate better and we have to understand better. 
I think that tone element is is huge. It's it's making sure that you know conversations we're having make make sense at this time. Uh, a couple of our clients are they're they're still having good success with some of their their partners and being able to convert from the live in person events to to more virtual elements. In fact, some of their partners have really stepped up to do more. Uh, and it has to do with the thought leadership piece that they, you know, the audience that uh, this one organization has really meshes well with all of their partners and what can be happening throughout, uh, throughout this crisis. Uh, so I think there's, there's opportunities to be had. Uh, it's a matter of making sure that what you're presenting from a property standpoint or what you're bringing from a brand standpoint, that it, it's got that fit and it's not going to come across as uh, as off-putting. Um, I can think about you know, one brand that has three different retail uh, avenues and I'm on their mailing list and they haven't changed their conversation at all. I get the same discounts offered to me every single morning, sometimes twice a day. Uh, and you know, it's, it rubs me the wrong way. And is that going to affect me in the future? I'm not, I'm not sure, but it just, it, it does stand out. Uh, and so it's looking at those brands that are pivoting now uh, they may be pulling back from sponsorship and doing marketing a different way, or they may be looking at sponsoring a different avenue. Uh, Brent, what's your experience been for seeing some of the ones who are doing it right? Uh, I think I think you nailed it um, when you talked about it's the tone and it's the messaging. Uh, uh, I'm not. I didn't come up with this this phrase. I've heard it a couple of times, and and I agree with it. And your brand right now, and I don't care whether you're a property, you're still a brand, or whether you're a, a business corporation um, and you're a brand or a sponsor, but everybody's brand is a value and it's how you present that brand, your brand, over this six, eight, 10, 12 week period, how you present yourself as a brand and what you're doing is going to be the way people will remember you for the next 10 or 12 years. Uh, what happened during COVID-19 and you're, you know, using your, your example, Brad, you're going to remember that business. And you know what, I've got one that's at the top of my in basket every morning, uh, you know, and, and they're, they're got another offer for me. And I, this morning I, I unsubscribed. Um, I'm, it's the wrong message. I don't need that from them right now. And um, when we stop to look at what some of the other companies are doing in the marketplace, I mean, one of the great ones, and, and I did share this on LinkedIn and Twitter, and um, if you didn't get it and you want to see it, uh, I'll try and find it, or you can email me at Reddit Partnership Group and I'll, uh, .ca and I'll try and find it for you. But it was the state of Arizona put out a, uh, a, a really professionally done and really great video about all four of their pro sports teams in the state of Arizona getting together and and uh, delivering a message that everything's going to be all right here in Arizona. You know, we're, we're going to get through this. And a real uplifting, professional, it was amazing. It was, you know, when you think about it, there's, there are no production studios. Um, you start to look at the, the messaging that some of the companies are, are doing, you know, that have had, had campaigns that were ready to go, <clears throat> like, the car companies. I mean, there isn't a there isn't a auto manufacturer in in Canada today that didn't already have content and video and and television and radio and outdoor ready to roll by the end of March for spring offers. Well, you know what? The smart ones have stopped. Uh, they're running messages like uh, you know uh, uh, around uh, promoting. Uh, helping others or they may be making an offer but that offer is around hey you know what we know these are tough times uh we're, we're gonna pick up i think it's four that's saying you know what if you bought a car or want to buy a car we're gonna pick up three months of it you know of your lease payments or your or your your um, uh, loan payments uh we just we want to be here for you and then I, I look at bc hydro i live out in nanaimo in in uh, british columbia and and bc hydro supplies you know it's basically a monopoly and and they supply uh you know electricity to all the homes and they sent out an email yesterday that said hey or two days ago i guess that said hey you know what 
we know that people are going through tough times. And if you've lost your job or you're affected by COVID-19 from a, from a revenue perspective, you're a small business or you're a big business, you don't have your companies closed down, uh, it doesn't matter. If just fill out this form. Tell us what it is that you're, you know, that's hurting you in COVID-19 financially. And uh, we'll, we'll credit you. We'll credit you for the average income or average billing for three months. So if my average bill was $100 a month, uh, they're going to give me a credit on my account for $300. So that means basically I'm not paying BC Hydro for the next three or four months. Uh, obviously, the electricity usage goes down in the summertime. So great to see that they're using last, the last three months uh, in, in the winter. So, but the end result is that I'm going to remember about that, about BC Hydro. I mean, the, the uh, telecoms have, have uh, uh, just about all of them have turned around and said, you know what, there are no overage fees. We are not, for the next three months, we are not going to do any overage fees. I know that um, there's, there's a lot of those types of things that are being done uh, in the marketplace to make it uh, make it way better. I mean, we've watched um, uh, scenarios like uh, uh, Budweiser, who's taken their their redirected five million dollars of their media buys and their sponsorships, and shifted it over specifically into COVID relief. And uh, and that message is getting out there. And they're not they're not buying the airtime to say what they're doing it's going out through social, it's going out through digital. People are appreciative. Uh, those of, you know, you that may be aware, I mean, Bauer, the hockey equipment product, uh, producer, has shifted to, to producing masks, uh, safe masks for, for healthcare workers. At the same time, Dyson, you know, whether it's a, your Dyson uh, dryer in the, in the public washroom or whether it's your Dyson that you're, you're vacuuming your house with, they've switched over to produce uh, ventilators. We've watched the um, a small, medium, and large uh, distilleries and breweries shift over production into sanit uh, sanitation uh, um, uh, products. So that we're, we're seeing this, those are the things that we're going to remember about those brands and about those companies. And I, 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 you know, the, other, the other two that come to mind um, are Allstate. Uh, they just gave up six hundred million dollars in revenue, and they uh, they basically said to their to their auto insurance clients, "We're cutting back fifteen percent off your premiums. Why? Because you're driving less. You don't need as much insurance coverage. That's six hundred dollars out of their pockets in revenue that they didn't have to do, but are doing. Um, now's the time." to shift, I believe, and I, I think anybody in, uh, that's in marketing will tell you this, that the, that the shift is away from selling a product. It's into building your brand and helping others. And so, for instance, the other big one that, that just happened in the last couple of days is Pepsi. I mean, they've taken their entire, they're redirecting their entire TV and digital budget for the next several months into the upcoming uh, One One World Together at Home concert that's happening on April 18th, uh, virtually and digitally. So we're, those are the things that we're going to remember. And, and now isn't the time to be selling your sponsorships, it's to be deepening your relationships, building relationships, starting relationships if you haven't got them with your partners and being able to see how we can help others whether that's your neighbor, whether it's your family, whether it's your coworker, or whether it's your, your partner in a sponsorship agreement. Um, how can we help them? Because at the other end of this, people are going to remember and how you position your brand today is how people are going to remember you for a very long time. And I think that's really important is there's so much change going on right now. Uh, and it's, you know, how do you help each other pivot? Uh, I you know the one organization that we're supporting their, their big element is that, you know, they've got all these CFOs and heads of finance uh, across the country and all of them are going through the same challenge uh, and their partners have been able to step up and go, you know, here's how we can step in and we can help people with our thought leadership and bring that through. Uh, one of the major vintners in Canada, yes, they've moved over a significant line to creating hand sanitizer, but their business has materially changed. Uh, they're, they're not producing the small format uh, bottled wine anymore. It's they've seen such an influx in demand for four liter box wine uh, that they have had to flip their whole process 
to put that out because that's where they're succeeding because their businesses change. Uh, so I know there's a number of brands on online here and happy to get your, your insight, but you know, how do, how do we work together to, to manage that pivot? Um, you know, there's, there's going to be an end to this and you know, coming out of SARS in 2003 and out of the, the, you know, the crash in 2008 and Brent, you know, more recently with you having a lot of work around the Calgary floods and the Fort Mac fires. Um, you know, what have you seen for how people can position themselves for that next stage? Well, I think that there's, there's a couple of things there that we need to be looking as you described it. There's, there's, Three stages I, I see at this, and you've identified those. And the, and the first one is is the immediacy, and um, we're hopefully for most of us through that immediacy stage, uh, which is we've been in this for three four weeks. Uh, but it, it's remove the panic, uh, uh, connect with your partners, understand the landscape, understand where we are today, and then the next stage is the recovery as you know isolation is, is lifted how is that going to affect our business our, our as a property as a brand what are the next steps um, and ultimately what will we look like or how are we going to manage our world post COVID-19 we, we don't have all those answers but I would say that that right now we need to be looking at, at planning for recovery and planning for post um, and starting to build out those strategies and start to, uh, to build out those plans as uh, uh, Terry and Andrew from uh, ATB mentioned on the on the uh, the last session here you know they're, they're a major sponsor with the uh, the CFL and with uh, both uh, the Step Peters in Calgary and the Eskimos in Edmonton and uh, you know they're they're integrated. They they know that the the look of what might be happening is probably a, a seven game deletion in the uh, in the schedule. So if that is to you know if they are to relaunch and start in you know mid July or late July and early August, how will that look? How does that affect? As he said, do we remove some activations? What what? are we going to do you can start to plan out um, the same thing goes as a property uh, you know we're, we're working with our partners uh, at uh, the Western Sponsorship Congress uh, the events that are being held in in Ottawa Toronto and Edmonton and you know it's it's about hey what's what is this going to look like? This is an end of September and, and two in October events and their conferences. Uh, we've come to the conclusion that based on, on all the research that we've been able to find is that the, yeah, the people are going to be ready to go They're They, they are going to need answers beyond this virtual that we're doing right now when, when the isolation is over. So how are we planning out those three events right now? And, and what is it, what is it going to look like? Uh, you know, from a speaker perspective, will there be a virtual component? Will there be uh, seating? Will there be farther apart? Will less people there because we don't want to overcrowd the rooms? Is you know, what are those elements, and what are the speakers going to talk about? And uh, you know, if we were planning speakers in January or February, we would have some great topics. But I think all those topics are going to have to change. It's going to be the reality of how are we coping with the post COVID-19? How is this affecting us? What can we do? What's the and once we start looking at that different world, like how is it different? Um, and that world is that, you know what, it probably is more virtual, it probably is more digital. I don't think you're going to go to a CFL game and, and be on the concourse without every 10 feet having, uh, having uh, sanitation stations for you. I mean, that, that didn't exist before. But we have to understand that there are places we can learn from on all of this. And 9-11 is a good example. I mean uh you know it, it crippled uh, north america for for a week or more and then impacted it economically for a very long time and when you look specifically at new york it, it was impacted for a very long time months uh, years so the end result is that what did we learn from that well look at security today versus security in august of uh, of 2001 you know we wouldn't feel safe going into an airport that didn't have security the way it is today. So how is that going to change and look different in the world of sponsorship? 
Uh, are we going to see way less activations that are going to happen, uh, especially on a sampling perspective? Are we going to have to go to virtual activations? What, what are the integration on that side? So all of those elements are going to become part of this. And so when you look at those three stages, the, the immediacy, the recovery period, and the post-COVID-19, uh, you should be in planning for all of those. I think the biggest thing that I would encourage everybody to be doing because I'm betting that you know based on the you know the 25 or so that are on this call right now that in that scenario I would say less than 10 percent have a disaster preparedness program that they implemented three weeks ago it either didn't exist or it was outdated or it didn't factor into this and if I look at something like the October 17 terrorist act in in Las Vegas um, and I, I, I look at that and that catastrophe that happened in the shootings and the number of people that were dead, that city and the, the Visitors and Convention Bureau had a uh, uh, up-to-date preparedness, disaster preparedness plan. And within 48 hours, within 48 hours, every single message around the world from a media buy perspective, every piece of outdoor, every piece of television, radio, digital, you name it, it was gone. It was removed and there was no, hey, come to Vegas and have a great time. It was gone within 48 hours. And they had a full plan that they implemented. And look at your own organizations today. We've had, you know, in the last 20 years, and most of us have been around for 20 years, and I look at who's on this call, uh, some of us may have been younger at certain points, but if we go from 9-11 and then we look at SARS that you mentioned uh, already, Brad, and we take a look at uh, the, uh, the, the catastrophe that happened in the Boston Marathon as well as the, uh, the scenario in, uh, in Las Vegas, and then we look at the, the natural disasters that have happened in Canada alone with the forest fires, and, and Adrian, uh, yourselves in Australia with the forest fires leading up to COVID. Um, all of these things, did we have plans to how to deal with that and how it would affect our sponsorship programs or what we needed to react to? Probably most of us didn't. And I would encourage that if something comes out of this, that uh, every one of us has a, and we might have the time to build them now, is to have that disaster prepared in this plan. I think that that, that fits into that three-stage uh, element of, of immediacy, recovery, and post. Yeah, and I think that sort of leads into sort of set, setting expectations about what you can or can't be doing at, in this stage. You know, everybody's looking at the revenue lines and probably getting pressure from the top going, okay, I've got business objectives I need to deliver on from a sponsor perspective. I've got you know, revenue line that I need to bring in from uh, you know, a property side that there's an expectation and a budget built on all this sponsorship or revenue coming in from uh, an event or a program. Uh, it's going, what can I do now? Uh, so are, you know, are there areas where, you know, people are doing well and they're well positioned to have these conversations? You know, should I be out selling and, uh, and cold calling people now? Uh, you know, how's that going to come across or is there a recommended approach? I, another great question, Brad, and I think that I think the answer from from our experience and what we're we're talking with our our partners about or our clients um, is that it, it's on an individual basis. It's um, understanding, as I said earlier, that first communication piece. Understand their business. Understand where they are, where they're hurting, and what you can do to help them. And that'll tell you whether now's the time to ask. Uh, you know, if, if you're talking to your property and you're talking to a brand and you say, hey, how are you doing with, we know that you were, you know, had these golf tournaments or you had that coming up. What are you doing? How are you managing that? Uh, I know our event is until, you know, you say to them, our event is until October, but, uh, and we're still planning on that or it isn't until November and we're still planning on it. How, how are you managing this stuff right now? If they say, hey, you know what, we're full steam ahead. We, uh, we're we actually talking about renewals for next year and that sort of stuff. So you know now that, okay, there, this is a discussion I can have with an ask in it. But if they talk about the, you know, how many people they've laid off and that they're, they're financially strapped, now's not the time to be talking about the ask. So um, when our clients say, what should we be doing? The answer isn't, hey, this is what you should be doing. Uh, you should be asking or you shouldn't be asking. It's about understand 
the specifics of that relationship with that partner, whether you're a brand or whether you're a, a property. And so uh, I think that that's, that's the first step with that. I think that it, it's about that shift in thinking about how can we help instead of what can I sell? I think that most companies um, right now are doing what they can first and foremost to take care of their staff, their employees. And that's the biggest priority they've got. And mental health and mental health awareness are, are key and critical during this time. I know, for example, um, one agency that is a uh, you know based out of Toronto, and it's it's uh, uh, they're they're an international agency. They have they have uh, uh, people all over all over North America, or sorry, all over the world. But they have a lot of young millennial type staff that live in Toronto and New York in downtown in apartments. And what they've asked them to do is, you know, if you, they were living alone, is to move in with somebody, go home and stay in mom's basement, uh, or go and live with your partner or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or whatever it is. We don't want you to be alone in your apartment for the next eight weeks. We, you know, it's not healthy for you. Um, so those are the types of things that people are doing uh, and getting, caring about their staff. And when I start to look at that, um, I don't see a lot of push from, from our clients on either side about, hey, we need to make these Q1 numbers or these two Q numbers or Q2 numbers. Um, those are secondary thoughts. Uh, I find that businesses are doing the right thing, or most of them are doing what I would consider the right thing now, rather than the business thing. And in some cases, it isn't the best business decision immediately. It may turn out to be, but it's about doing what's right rather than doing what's expected. Is there anybody like that wants to add to that? Uh, feel free to speak up. It's uh, this is been sounding like Brad and I show, and I'd love to hear from, you know, some of the other people. I think uh, Karen from Sun Life's on here. Uh, um, I'm not sure if John Windwick from ATB is on, or I know that Christy Cruz is here as well. Um, if you've got, you know, feedback or thoughts, we'd love to hear what you have to say. That didn't go a long way. I gotta stop picking up people, I guess. <laughs> Um, I can share. Oh, hey, Adrian. Hey, down how under. are you guys? I'm good. How are you? Yes, really good. Beautiful morning here in Melbourne. <laughs> but um, yeah, I thought I'd share a little bit about what's happening here in Australia. Um, so I find generally what's happening with COVID, I, I typically check out what's happening in Canada. And then I find a week later, that's what's happening here in Australia. So I think from a, from a general, let's say working environment, yeah, I think what we're seeing is, is brands and brands, whether that be a rights holder or a brand are looking after the people. What we're finding is that people are, I think they've been at home for a couple of weeks now and, and organizations are struggling. Leaders have been telling me they're struggling with how do we keep the motivation levels up? Cause they're starting to see energy levels drop because people aren't used to working from home for this prolonged period of time. So I know that's a big focus just from a brand perspective um, or from a worker and individual perspective. Um, I think Brent touched this on, on this earlier, the context of the Australian market. Um, we just come off bushfires uh, in January. <clears throat> and even from a brand and, and rights holder perspective, there's a lot of activity planned to support communities that were impacted by bushfires. And obviously those have all been pressed pause. So a lot of the planning that's been going on is kind of all for nothing right now. Um, what we're seeing on the brand side is, and Brent alluded to this, is that for some, the, the sponsorship side isn't the top priority. I've seen some sponsorship teams being reallocated to community programs where brands are um, looking to support the community in different ways. So there's a brand here that's called RACV. It's been in the market for 143 years. It's a insurance brand and their marketing team is now working on how do we get meals out to the homeless during this period of time because there's not as much support for them um i've also seen some you know some interesting little um activations we've got one of the aussie rules football teams where they're offering free personal training programs 
um, that one of the brands have partnered up with one of the players to offer that from their home. So every, every morning you can jump on and for 30 minutes, families can do a, a personal training program with one of their favorite players from one of the sporting teams. Um, even something simple as jumping on the Zoom bandwagon. Um, I love Brent's uh, backdrop there. And we've seen one of the brands team up with Netball Australia and they're providing, um, you know, just Zoom backdrops with some of the players around, around the league. So simple little things like that, because we're, you know, used to the use of Zoom across kids. I've got three kids and two of them now have Zoom accounts because they're catching up with you know, their friends. We're starting to see little activations like that. Um, from a rights holder's perspective, um, to give you some context with the major sporting codes, most codes from a league perspective and from a team perspective have stood down 70 to 80% of their staff for four to 12 weeks. Um, and then just yesterday, the National Rugby League came out and said, we're going to be starting to play games on 21st of May. <clears throat> it seems quite uh, aggressive at this stage, but it, it seems they're gaining government support to start some games. So it will be interesting to see what impact that has, whether that actually happens, and two, then what impacts and opportunities that creates for brands. Um, racing. So <clears throat> in Australia, we've got a public holiday in New South Wales dedicated uh, or sorry, in Victoria, we've got we've got a public holiday rated uh, allocated to horse racing. So whether it's the dogs or the horses, very very popular here in Australia, they are still going. So this you're still seeing some opportunities for for brands and rights holders um, to activate. Um, and and from an events perspective, we just had ECA, which in Queensland is a major. It's kind of like the e exhibition or the fair. I'm originally from Saskatoon. We we called it the exhibition. Um, but essentially it's when all the, all the folks from the farming communities come into the city and, and, and um, there's lots of brands that are selling products to the farmers. Um, that's on August 7th. That's been cancelled. So we're seeing a real mix and I think people are still kind of coming up with different plans and still reacting. I think um, there's an author, Daniel Pink, and uh, he's a New York Times bestseller and he wrote the book When. And he talks about how the brain's... Uh, working patterns there's a peak there's a trough and there's a recovery i still feel worse we're kind of at this peak period of going what's happening and i think we're and i think brands i run a group called the sponsorship lab for brands we catch up on a quarterly basis and just talk about some of the, the challenges that are going on and we share knowledge on how we can deal with them um, and early early indications where brands were saying we want to help out our rights holders like we realize this is a tough time for them, particularly when they're when they're the rights holders are laying off people. But I think what will be really interesting from a brand, and this is where the opportunities will come, is when we start to get in that trough, when the financial impacts are hitting us, um, hitting brands a little bit harder, and, and we're starting to see that bottom line impacted more, and there's a little bit more pressure that comes with that. I think that's going to be the real opportunity for brands to shine if there's that opportunity. So to me, it's kind of at this stage, it's kind of, yeah, let's, let's band together. And then when it's going to get really tough, I think that's, for me, that's going to be the interesting time to see how brands react. That was great, Adrian. Thanks. Yeah, you see, you're out in the backyard again. That's where you were when we talked last week. I'm inside today because it's oh. five o'clock in the morning. And believe it or not, it's, it's cold here. It's about six degrees. So uh, I, I've come, come inside today. Looks like Christy was going to say something. Yeah. Hey guys, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Hello, everyone. From the uh, just similar to the last speaker, we're in the uh, balmy metropolis full of palm trees and, and pools called Calgary, Alberta, where we got another dump of snow. So we definitely should take the blame for pissing off Mother Nature because she gave us COVID because of us, I think, and our whining and complaining about snow and it's never ending. Anyway, so besides that, I just wanted to say um, thank you for inviting me onto the call. I think it's really great. It's been really helpful. Brent, thank you very much, Brad. Super um, good work uh, and just kind of helping us understand what the situation looks like. From a brand perspective, I think something that Brent said is really important, which is uh, regardless of what situation we're in, whether it's a wildfire, whether it's something as big as this public health crisis, brands are still here because of their reputation. And so the more that you can do around helping the brands to 
amplify uh, what they what their value is, amplify the work that they're doing. I think all of us have a role to play in thanking those who are doing great work. So I know that from a consumer standpoint, consumers are doing a really great work, uh, job of helping uh, certain key subsets like first uh, frontline workers and health workers and nurses and doctors. That kind of love and outpour should also be coming from the, um, Brent, help me out. What do you guys call it? The properties. Um, properties. The properties. It's something that the properties can really do because it's something third party validation is just as important, if not Im more important during a disaster than it is in regular times. We're still fighting for brand love. We're still fighting for reputation and increasing the awareness of our brand. We're still extremely competitive. And I think that's something that we don't talk about a lot. So even though you might see uh, the banks, um, you know, always drive us crazy because they do kind of hold hands in kumbaya at times. And we love that, but you're not going to find that with the telephone companies. I'll tell you that right now. That's just not going to happen. It's never going to happen. It's just the way that certain industries are. But even with the banks, you're starting to see individual banks come out and say, sure, we all held hands for that one ad, but now we're all again competing for your business. So what can the properties do to make sure that they're highlighting, amplifying, and continuing to spread the good news, acting almost like a semi-agency, uh, communications agency for the brands that, um, are, that you are in a partnership agreement with. I think that's really important. I think Back that's, to you. Thanks a lot, Christy, and thanks for that input. It's, it, it is, it's true. It's, it, as I said earlier, what, what, what those brands do, whether you're a TELUS or whether you are the Calgary Stampede, I, I don't care um, that uh, you're a brand and what you do in this period of time, people are going to remember you for. And it's, it's that key of market share and brand share and brand recognition that becomes critical. I, I wanted to quickly jump, if it's okay, Brad, um, over to uh, Jennifer who asked a question about digital and the shift to digital and activations uh, on the Zoom chat, uh, group chat there. Okay. Um, and I don't know if everybody can see this or if everybody's clicked their button to get, have the chat there, but she said, I'd love to hear some creative ideas on how to heighten sponsor experience when delivering online or virtual events. Are there any unique examples out there to ensure that sponsors will have engagement and activation opportunities with, with attendees. Uh, I'm going to answer that sort of in two steps. The first one is, <clears throat> what can they do today? Because they can't activate. There, there's nothing they can do to activate. But it's shifting those dollars or activation dollars into other programs that we've already discussed, like uh, like what Pepsi's doing with the upcoming concert. And, and uh, uh, you know, the other one that, that I saw recently was Chipotle uh, running a virtual community strategy, building out support and, 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 uh, and, and doing it all online. And Chipotle, the restaurant in the States, I mean, I think there's some of them here in Canada, but they have over 500 million uh, impressions on a daily video session that it's doing through, through their efforts with Zoom. I mean, those are things that, as Christy just talked about, about building brand their activation dollars have gone over there. So short term, those activations from a digital side is what can I do to, you know, I mean, maybe it's a brand stepping up and saying, you know what, I can't, I can't do anything for TIFF right now, um, or I can't do anything for this conference that's now been canceled. But why don't I help them to do a virtual conference? Or why don't I help them to produce a series of workshops like this is, has been done by Sponsor Circle. You know, those sorts of things and creating digital opportunities to engage people today. And the message always has to be uh, one of how can we help you, not that we have something to sell to you. So I think that that's the, the digital change right now is, is around the um, uh, specifics of how can we go digital, whether it's with Zoom, whether it's a, a virtual workshop, whether it's uh, supplying uh, content uh, online and digitally uh, through your partners and through yourselves to be able to help people in this time of need. So I think that's where the immediate digital 
uh, activation is. The other post, when we come back after, you know, after the, the trough area and after the uh, recovery uh, and the, uh, the post-COVID-19 scenario, I, I think that we are going to see a more digital scenario from the perspective that, uh, and you're looking for innovative ideas, I, I think that some of those ideas are the things that you need to look at from a pos position of, um, you know, engaging uh, uh, with with uh, sampling by digital means. So can we do something, you know, with a tap? Can we do something with our phones? Can we do something with, you know, I mean, a lot of, uh, I know Visa has lim increased their limit from $100 to $250. So people don't have to the, to key in if they buy something over $100, they can actually just tap still uh, their phone or their card or whatever it is. So, so there's some of those types of things. How can that be integrated into a sampling opportunity? How can I, how can I test something from that perspective? Uh, as I said uh, on the last session, maybe it could be about, you know, creating a digital uh, link uh, which now takes you back into their, their website and you can order the product for free and to test it out. So there, I think there's those types of digital. I, I also, uh, coming back to the immediate thing, is that <clears throat> um, another one is if, if, in a, uh, if you look at Pokemon Go, I, I mean, they've tweaked their product. I mean, you take a look at Pokemon Go and Facebook groups. These have been around since 2016, three, four years. And they, they you know, they're groups where people can exchange social, you know, you know, video chat and quickly engage from that perspective with their friends and with their family. Well, these have become humongous now. They, they've, they've moved into this world. Uh, and if even if you look back at, at Facebook's um, uh, campaign around uh, uh, advertised in the Super Bowl uh, around promoting it earlier this year. <clears throat> so when we look at those group chats and we look at those scenarios, I look at Pokemon too. I mean, they've created a, a um, indoor platform. So their platform has gone to indoors instead of being outdoors because people can't go outdoors so that type of tweaking what are you doing within your property or what are you doing within your brand that you can tweak to make applicable to people in their homes instead of coming to your event and experiencing it so when i look at it uh, the regional district of nanaimo uh, and it, i'm i'm looking at them specifically here uh but this has been done by municipalities uh, all across the country uh, but it, you know typically they would have had seniors coming in to work with you know to do a, uh, a play gin rummy or whatever in their halls or in their in their uh, uh, meeting rooms or they would have had a fitness class or a yoga class so they've gone virtual they've gone digital with this so that type of an you know, opportunity so how can I as a sponsor what if I typically would have sponsored that gin rummy game what can I do now from a virtual side to that, can I make that happen virtually so that these seniors don't have to meet in the in the in the boardroom at the the community center? They can meet on a uh, on a, uh, a session like this on Zoom or on uh, Google Meets or, or whatever it is, and I can make that happen as a partner, as a sponsor, to to engage in that and activate from that perspective. Activation is going to have a different term or different perspective it's not going to be simply the touch feel hold uh, that it has been in the past it is going to be digital from this perspective and that's what activation is making things happen so people can experience them and i think that that's where we're going to see that shift in the future i hope i hope that that answers your question jennifer if not just add to it and somebody else will probably answer it way better brad back to you Sorry, busy taking myself on mute. Oh, sorry. No, I think it's, it's really important. There's going to be you know, a lot of new engagement. We've got a lot of new engagement. We've got to look at new ways to deliver impact. Uh, part of that is uh, looking at values or values or valuation. Uh, so you've got uh, Collision as a great example. You know, twenty-eight to thirty thousand people that were supposed to be coming to a conference here in Toronto in in June, and they've moved to Collision online. Uh, and having conversations with them, the you know the sponsor dollars that they were commanding uh, and getting 
uh, as for the live event, uh, moving into a virtual event, it's a, it's a fraction of that. Uh, so it's being able to to sit there and look at okay, you know, I've got these revenue expectations, but moving into a new model, model means changing the model of uh, of those dollars. Mm -hmm. Nervous, you jump in. Yeah, I wanted to share some of my experiences uh, over the last for the last 15 years. I've been working with fairly large companies, helping them to introduce technology into their communication and training strategies, uh, including uh, talents as well as law laws. And there are benefits, and sometimes it takes moments like these that force us to make change, make significant change, and perhaps look a little bit beyond our traditional framework. Uh, and in fact, uh, ATB was talking about that um, on the session just a little while ago. When you think about talking online, having training sessions or any kind of communication, it's not something that we've been doing for very long, but it's something that's becoming part of the norm. And certainly with COVID, it's happening every day. We're finding that we are, you know, business on the top uh you know party on the bottom loungewear now and uh, it's it's totally changing uh, our our framework and there are there are good things that can come from webinars so if you think you think about from a sponsorship standpoint when it's an event it's it sometimes is just you know one day out of the year Whereas when, it come, when you come to webinar series, for some industries, it's a really great opportunity for folks to be able to present themselves as thought leaders over the course of uh, an education program. And then you're talking about multiple touch points over the course of a year, which when you're talking about sponsorship, it's a great way for folks to, for, for consumers to make their way through the path to purchase um, to conversion. So there are great things associated with webinar if they're thought out, um, they're well thought out, and um, and to to embrace it because it's it's really not going to go away even as we um, even as we move back to community based and you know and physical uh, you know activations um, it's 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 going to be here to stay as as folks get more um, comfortable with uh, online experiences. I'd love to use the example and build on what you said, Mary Beth, is that, um, you know, if you take a look at the collu uh, uh, collusion, I was going to say collision, and, uh, you know, it's a, it is a, you know, three-day event in Toronto, and then it's over. And if that was to look at it as a sponsor, I can have, you know, you know seven touch points over the year versus two touch points over a, over a three day period, that's a more value to me. And if I can be integrated into the topic and a whole bunch of stuff. So there's, there's dollars there. And wh where I see that physically have, has been done really, really well is with TIFF. I mean, TIFF is a, you know, Toronto International Film Festival. But if you look at TIFF, it is way more than that. That's, that's a couple of weeks of it that they are a 365 operation. I mean, they're doing screenings and, and, and film uh, presentations and knowledge and learning, and they support a whole bunch of other smaller uh, uh, festivals through the uh, Bell Lightbox. And so when you start to look at all that, they've done a really good job in the, the real world and in the touch, feel, and hold world um, and on-site world. Now it's doing exactly what Beth is mentioning, and that is to take that into a virtual world. And it's the same concept, it's just different products as, as you're going through it. I think that I think that, that shift is something that, that, that we need to be looking at. And that in turn is gonna change uh, to Jen's question here that how is that gonna affect community relations and, um, and marketing and communications overall? Um, yeah, I don't have the answer, but I think what you're going to see is that there's got to be a lot more storytelling. There's got to be the, the we're going to shift into this digital world that there's an opportunity to tell stories and whether that's in video, whether that's online, whether that's, uh, you know, in written form or whether it's, uh, it, it's an activation type product engaging somebody in a digital world. But I also want to identify that I don't believe in all the research that's that's been done to date over the last uh, four weeks. 
statistics um, is showing that, you know, live events aren't going to stop. There, you know, people are already itching to get back into a football stadium and to get back into a, a hockey arena to see the playoffs, uh, to see whatever's going to happen next. They're 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 anticipating and, and excited to go to the concerts and the festivals and the experiences this summer because they've been cooped up for a month. What's it going to be like at the end of three months? So I don't see any of that going away. It's going to come back and it's going to come back in a big way to start with because everybody's going to be wanting to get revenue in. Yeah, I think the second part of Jen, your question around just, you know, when are we going to know? And that's the big challenge is that, you know, you don't necessarily know you've gone through the stage until you've gone through it. Uh, definitely coming out of SARS in 2003, uh, you know, we thought we were clear. Uh, April, beginning of May, we started, you know, launching some campaigns. We brought in some partners and then the second wave of SARS hit the third week of May. Uh, so then that kind of froze everything. So I think you're going to find that there's going to be some stutter steps. Uh, it's being able to be flexible with that, uh, working with your partners and just saying, okay, we're going to try this. We're going to see how it's going to roll out. Uh, and then, you know, as you've seen with other kind of uh, issues when it comes to having that emergency plan is, okay, if something else happens, how do we pivot? How do we shift the message, pause the message, or change the message? Um, and, you know, as Brent was talking about Las Vegas and how they were able to create all that turnaround is just preparedness. Uh, and I think that's one of the teachings from here. Uh, looking at the time, it will definitely know that everybody's you know, been here for an hour. And thank you so much for all of your time. Uh, you know, some of, the, some of the takeaways I think we can offer out of this or take from this. Uh, you know, you've asked a question, Adrian, about just force majeure. Uh, and you know how that's coming into play because people are looking at their contracts. They're trying to figure out, okay, you know, should I be enforcing that? Uh, and I think it's all about partner relations. It's working with both sides of the partnership and and seeing what works. If you know if you're desperate for the funds and you want to go ahead from force majeure, and this is me not giving any legal advice on this, uh, is that you know, you may end up burning a bridge that could be so much greater to have uh, down, down the road. So if you can make that adjustment with somebody to say, okay, you know what, I don't need the money until July. So that payment you were supposed to give me right now, let's, you know, let's see how we can adjust that. The, the more flexible you can be with your partners uh, on both sides, uh, the better. And even with the sponsors being able to understand the operational needs of, of the properties they're working with, uh, that can be really helpful to say, okay, you know, maybe you need part of the payment now to keep your lights on, uh, but then we can shift it to later because there's definitely a lot of concerns on the, on the revenue side for a lot of the sponsors. They're looking at how do I keep staff on. Uh, the other elements, definitely the, the virtual piece is, you know, how, how can I take my, my work virtual? How, what elements can I provide? What, uh, you know, what programming makes sense? How to integrate a sponsor? Uh, and I think the, the last one is having the right tone. Uh, so it's, you know, sponsors and, and brands are looking to make sure that they are offering the right messaging in light of everything that's out here. Uh, you know, coming flat is gonna have a huge impact uh, in the long run. So they wanna make sure they've got the right messaging. So if you can echo uh, some of the positioning that they're providing, that's gonna, you know, bolster that partnership uh, moving forward. Uh, so I think there's a, you know, a couple of great elements there. Really happy to have everybody you know, providing their insight. Uh, we're running another session next week, which is actually gonna be focused on uh, uh, pivoting your tech, looking at virtual events, communication, virtual communications, how we can integrate sponsors in that. Mary Beth's gonna bring her wealth of experience uh, in that space to that chat. So uh, it's available on Eventbrite. Uh, you can go to a virtual coffee chat sponsorship. We'll, we pop up on the top. Uh, otherwise, we'll send it out to everyone here. Uh, again, thank you everybody for participating in this. Thank you, Brent, for your contributions. Much appreciated. Uh, Thanks for having me. Yeah, stay safe and uh, looking forward to working with everybody.